Welcome to Lessons with Dr. Ted. As I mentioned in my video on Aristotle's elements, plot is structure. There are all sorts of models for structure. The hero's journey, as described in great depth by Joseph Campbell, is one. It is particularly useful in analyzing the structure of epics and fantasy and science fiction. In the 19th century, the Scribe Sardou model was developed. This is also called the well-made play. It is very popularly used by people in the film industry. The one I'm going to use is Freytag's Pyramid of Dramatic Structure. Gustav Freytag was a German writer. He wrote an important book called The Technique of the Drama. He also wrote a slew of novels and plays, and he believed in Prussian hegemony, destruction of the Poles, and German nationalism, and was something of a racist. However, his book on drama is quite important, not only because it is thorough, but because it is for the most part right and applicable to most forms of written and performed arts. Let's start off by saying that this model, and all models for that matter, are not rules or laws. To be fair, in some media, the structures are more rigid than others. Television, for example, has some fairly rigid rules. Commercials have to happen at regular intervals that are determined by advertisers and the industry, not writers and other artists. You also know that it's how long an episode is going to be. Sitcoms are usually about 21 to 22 minutes long. Hour-long dramas are about 45 minutes or so. In the 16th and 17th century France, for example, acts of plays were always about the same number of lines because the running crew had to change the candles before they burned out. The running crew, by the way, got to keep the wax to sell for their own profit. There were other rules in France about this time concerning the arts, and I'll discuss them in a later video. Theater, film, and literature are not as rigid with structure and form as television is. Theater and film historically have time constraints that affect structure. That is because audiences generally want the story done in one sitting and will stay seated for only so long. Two or three hours is usually long enough. A novel can be a thousand or a million pages long, in theory, and can play fast and loose with any structure. Again, these are not rules. This guy, and I don't mean the Earl of Oxford, probably never heard of the five-act structure, even though his plays fit it. These guys had likely never heard of the Marathon of the Middle or thought about putting energetic markers anywhere. They were first and foremost storytellers. Some writers care a lot about these formulae. We call the product formulaic. Back to Freytag's Pyramid of Dramatic Structure. This is Freytag's Pyramid at its simplest. Okay, maybe that is a little too simple. Perhaps I can go into a little more detail. Notice how the pyramid can be easily cut into five parts. Did you ever notice how Shakespeare's plays divide nicely into five acts? He certainly did not put act and scene numbers into his plays, and the earliest editions don't have them. People might debate who wrote Shakespeare, what his sources were, what, what the lines mean. I've never heard of any disagreement on where the, the acts and scenes end. Perhaps without knowing anything about structure, Shakespeare structures his plays perfectly. So, especially since Shakespeare was good enough for Freytag, we will go over the purpose of each act in the structure using one of Shakespeare's plays. You might have heard of this one. If you're lucky, your high school teacher showed you this one and not this one. Back to Shakespeare's play. Act 1. Nothing really happens in Act 1. I mean, stuff happens, but story doesn't. Exposition happens. What is exposition, you ask? What is exposition, Dr. Ted? I'm glad you asked. Exposition sets up the world the characters live in. It introduces the main characters. It establishes time and place, establishes certain conflicts, and general background information needed for the story. A little digression for the moment. Conflict is really important. Without conflict, you don't have much of a story. You have to have some sort of tension to make it interesting. Generally speaking, conflict is... 
man versus man. By the way, one of the reasons war movies often do well is that you don't really have to explain the reasons behind the conflict. No one cares. There's a war on. People fight. Even better if you're killing Nazis. Don't need to justify it at all. Man versus nature. Though in this film, the bear, it might be nature versus man. Man versus self. Man versus God. Back to exposition. In Act 1 of Romeo and Juliet, the story of Romeo and Juliet actually does not happen. What happens is... It is Verona, some time in the Renaissance. Notice the funny hats and the cod pieces. And look at how young Basil Exposition, uh, Michael York is. The Montagues and the Capulets are feuding. Tybalt is a badass. Okay, so that version does have a few good moments. Mercutio is a bit of a nutcase and is a buddy of Romeo's. It is Sunday, so Romeo is in love again. With a Capulet, by the way. Juliet is already 13, so she should be married. Her parents want her to marry Paris, so they will have a party that night so the two can meet. Oh, and this is important. The prince has said if anyone fights, heads will roll. There you have it. That is what happens in Act 1. Notice the story hasn't even started yet. See that circle between Acts 1 and 2? Yeah, that one. This is called the inciting incident. It is the moment where the story really begins. It is usually in Act 2, Scene 1, though it can be any place, really. In Romeo and Juliet, it's when the two meet. Act 2 deals with the events following the inciting incident. What follows is the rising action. The main story starts, the writer creates interest, obstacles are set up and overcome, and there are all sorts of possible outcomes, but the piece focuses on the main story or stories. A note on obstacles. If there were no obstacles, Frodo and Sam would simply walk into Mordor and toss the ring into the fire. Even Peter Jackson would have trouble turning that into nine hours, though God knows he would try. In Romeo and Juliet, Tybalt's angry. Romeo and Juliet fall in love, decide to get married. Romeo and Juliet prepare to get married. Note the basket that the friar has. He's discussing herbs and drugs and explains them all to Romeo and to the audience. This moment does nothing at the time, but it comes in handy when the friar has to know all about exotic drugs when he speaks to Juliet in Act 4. This is called foreshadowing. Something is said or happens that reinforces something important much later in the story. They get married, and there's great rejoicing. Yay! In the last scene of Act 2. This is hardly the end of their relationship, but it is the end of this phase of their relationship. Tension, suspense, obstacles. All this leads us to Act 3. Right in the middle of Act 3, that is, right in the middle of the play, is what Freitag calls the climax. Okay, okay, I realize that when you hear that word in the context of a play or a movie or book, you're thinking something like this. Most of us do. However, I'm assured by everyone I know who speaks German, I don't, that this is what Freitag is saying. What he means is what Aristotle calls crisis, I know that sounds like a run on the bank. What they both mean is the main turning point that stops the rising action and bends the story into the falling action. The events of Act 3 are those events, for the most part, that surround the main turning point. To add to any confusion is that directors of plays often have different ideas about what the main turning point is. Most productions of a play have one of these. Whatever happened right before the intermission is probably what the director thinks is the main turning point, even if he's wrong. The intermission in Romeo and Juliet tends to be right after this, most likely because whoever plays Romeo is pretty tired. However, this is Act 3, Scene 1. This is a bit early for the main turning point. Even though this is a beautiful scene, it's probably too late. 
This, by the way, is when Romeo and Juliet bid each other farewell after they've consummated the, the marriage the night before. The turning point is Act 3, Scene 3. Juliet has already decided in Scene 2 that she will stay with Romeo. Friar Lawrence, always a big help, convinces Romeo to go to Juliet and consummate their relationship. If nothing else, this will make it harder for anyone to pretend that this marriage didn't happen. Romeo's pretty much screwed already. The Capulets are going to have him whacked. There was hope for Juliet, but once she makes that decision, there's not much more she can do. The rest of the act follows through to Lord Capulet telling Juliet to marry Paris or else, and the consummation and the farewell. Next comes the falling action. The falling action is the part of the play that is Act 4 in a five-act play. This is when all the events begin to tumble down from the climax and lead us to the events of Act 5. The events overtake the characters who begin to lose control. This is when the friar comes up with his wonderful plan to drug Juliet. Juliet takes the drug. The Capulets decide she's dead. There are still a lot of possibilities. The tragic ending does not have to happen. However, it is getting harder to avoid. That is why we have Act 5 is where we get the catastrophe. Right there. While, of course, this would be catastrophic, this is not what Freitag necessarily means. Though, it, this is now the time to start thinking about this. And no, it does not need to be this big or anything like this. Freitag was writing mostly about tragedies, so the big ending would likely be more catastrophic than, well, well, most weddings. Act 5 is where all the events leading right up to and immediately following the big ending, however you want to call it, happen. Once Romeo goes to the apothecary and gets the deadly drug, we know he's planning on killing himself. Now that Romeo has killed Paris, his options are few and far between. The prince might be convinced to forgive Romeo for the death of Tybalt and even protect him, but he's not going to after Romeo kills his kinsman. Okay, he does ultimately forgive Romeo, but that's after Romeo and Juliet are already dead. When Romeo finds Juliet seemingly dead with no friar in sight, there's not much avoiding this. When Juliet awakens only to find her husband dead at her feet and her only friend gone, the friar runs off, you can see how this was hard to avoid. What follows is the denouement. That is, is there anything else that we need to know or any loose ends that need to be tied up? Now, denouement is a pretty hard word to remember, so there's a little fact and mnemonic that might help. In 1962, when Jean Chandler first wrote The Duke of Earl, Francis Hollingsworth, the fifth Duke of Earl, threatened to sue. So for the first few performances, until Chandler's lawyers were able to blackmail Francis with pictures of him and the Viscount Biggleswater, Chandler sang the song with a slightly different opening lyrics, written by Allen Ginsberg. De, 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 de nous mon, de, de, de nous mon, de, de, de nous mon. So there you have Romeo and Juliet and Freytag's Pyramid of Dramatic Structure. Shakespeare's plays almost all fit into the model quite nicely. Except A Midsummer Night's Dream. The conflicts in that play are done by the end of Act 4, even though the, the reason the people like the play is Act 5. Go figure. Various productions might well come across as a little different. Most Shakespeare is deservedly cut. Most directors do most of their cuts from Act 4. Act 1 is a lot of fun. Act 2 is romantic and beautiful. Act 3 is exciting. Act 5 is tragic. Act 4 is a lot of talk about suicide and a lot of crying. It is important to note that everything you need to know for Romeo and Juliet to make sense is contained between the two covers. 
or more precisely, from the prologue to the epilogue, or the curtain to the curtain, or the lights down to the lights up, however you're experiencing it. Plot is structure. In Act One, almost anything can happen. Juliet marries Paris and dies in childbirth. Romeo marries someone. Mercutio overdoses. Tybalt can't help himself. Guts some Montague servant and gets executed. Who knows? Once you get to Act Two, the inciting incident has happened, limiting the possible outcomes. Now we have Romeo and Juliet wanting to get together. They have a story. They may get married. Their families could be all right with this. Anything could happen, but still, it's now Romeo and Juliet. Once the main turning point happens, options are limited. Things start getting out of control in Act 4. Act 5 is inevitable. We're not done, of course. There will be future videos that complete our discussion of plot and of Aristotle's other elements. Please stay tuned and subscribe. If you enjoyed my video, please like and subscribe. Check out my other videos.